All right. Uh, so everyone, please take your seats. Uh, we're going to try to keep moving on schedule here. Uh, I'm pretty surprised that we're actually just about on time, because as per your schedule at 3.50, uh, we, have, um, we have a member of the Prime Minister's Economic Advisory Council, Mr. Sanjeev Sanyal. Uh, Mr. Sanjeev Sanyal has written extensively on the connection of India's ancient civilizational roots uh, and its connection to modern economic policy and development. And he'll be moderated by one of our uh, fantastic uh, SIPEC student members, uh, Mr. Prakar Goyal, an undergraduate student. So please give them a very warm welcome. So thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we, I'm really excited to get into, um, to, to, to learn more about your insights in economics, urban planning, uh, his, history, etc. So yeah, as Arman mentioned, your approach to economics often involves drawing insights from historical contexts. So are there any specific lessons from history that you find particularly relevant today? Yes, I mean, um, you know, Indians like to say that, you know, we were a great economy in the ancient times till, you know, a thousand years ago, we accounted for a third of the world economy uh, till 500 years ago for about a quarter of the world economy and so on. Uh, but the fact is that you have to understand that that perception of that economy is not a static place that was closed and everybody sat around and, and ruminated about the world. No. Uh, India was a great place precisely because it was connected to the rest of the world uh, and Indians were famous for being risk takers. Uh -huh. um, you may not realize this, but um, you know, India was a maritime nation that was sailing across the Indian Ocean, um, exploring places, you know, so you think, you see European uh, Renaissance begins with the Europeans exploring the world. Mm -hmm. and those, um, this part of the world got discovered by somebody trying to find their way to India. Uh, India at some point in its history had that attitude. There were Indians getting into ships and sailing out to the Southeast Asia, all the way to Japan and then to Korea. In fact, people don't realize this. Korean history begins with the marriage of a local, princess, uh, of a local prince to a princess from Ayodhya. That's how Korean history as taught in their textbook starts. Okay? And similarly, on the, in the other direction, there were Indians sailing in, during Harappan times, that's the Bronze Age. Um, and so when you go to the Middle East and see a lot of Indians, well, they were there in the Bronze Age as well. In Sumerian towns, there are records <coughs> of a people called Meluhans who came from the East bearing peacocks and, and uh, elephant tusk and all that, which are clearly Indians, uh, from Gujarat, by the way, uh, who were sailing out and settling in these places to trade. Um, so there was this huge amount of uh, trade going in either direction. And we were sort of outward, risk-taking uh, culture. So in fact, the first mention of an Indian outside of India is from a court case in Sumeria 4,500 years ago, uh, which involved a, uh, a Meluhan, i.e. Indian, uh, punching a local in a drunken brawl. And then he was found to be, uh, so there's a court case, he loses the court case and he's fined um, three or four silver coins. Um, so I've always speculated whether this is the origin of prohibition in Gujarat. <laughs> so I think no, that, that's just something so interesting about your approach to economics, just how you marry history and economics together. I think that's just really fascinating. So, this takes me to my next question. In an interview that you gave with Economic Times, I think a couple years ago, you mentioned that it's time for an intellectual pushback um, against the Western dominated narrative against India. And you're talking about how India has been such an outward facing culture, such an outward facing nation. And over the past few years, we've especially risen to global, um, to, to, to the forefront of the international community. So, as India ascends to the leading rungs of this community, how can India and other emerging nations from the global south reshape the direction of discourse um, and exert greater influence? So, yes, we need to engage with the rest of the world, but we need to engage with it in our own terms. And let's not kid ourselves, uh, the rest of the world is not going to make space for us just like that. So, <clears throat> there will be deliberate efforts to try and tie us up in various ways. I'll give you some examples of it. 
Uh, you will find that all the, whenever these think tanks, uh, particularly in the North Atlantic, they create these rankings of, you know, freedom, democracy, and all these kinds of things. India always does very badly. Have you noticed this? Yeah? So, for example, uh, you know, there is a, um, a press freedom index, uh, and India turns up to be below Afghanistan. You've got to be kidding me. Even, we, by the way, in 2022, there was one index in which we were below Afghanistan, even an academic freedom index. I mean, you've got to be kidding me. They don't even allow women into their schools, forget their universities. Um, so, I mean, it's quite obvious that there is an agenda based here. And, uh, in fact, I wrote a series of pieces which are online, you can read them, um, about how this is part of a psychops uh, system. And almost all of these, uh, th these um, indices are come up from a very tiny number of think tanks, all of which are in um, uh, the North Atlantic. There are a small number of countries and a relatively small number of think tanks which basically hand out certificates to each other. Uh, to people, you're a good boy, you're a bad boy, and in a sense, this is a form of colonial control, right? Because if you work to certain um, interests, i.e. you buy uh, the approved vaccines, for example, uh, then uh, you will be a given a good boy certificate. Now, this is, as I said, something we need to be willing to push back against, and nobody had been pushing back against them. In fact, in India, we're happily, you know, having debates about whether how to get, go up these, value, these rankings. I'm sorry, why on earth do we even care about it? So I am of the view that we need to create our own uh, um, indices, and I'm encouraging think tanks and other institutions in India to come up with our own sovereign ratings, our own uh, indices, and so on. And within the next one year, you'll see several of them. Now, other interesting thing in all of this is part of my, as part of this research, I also found something very interesting. So all these think tanks are there, maybe about 20 of them. But I looked into their funding, and you'll be amazed. Some four institutions, four sort of sources of funding account for all of it. George Soros's Open Society, Rockefeller, Ford Foundation, OMEDR. All of these you know, so what they've done is their four institutions have created these layers of other institutions. To, it's almost like, you know, how money laundering happens by creating layers of accounts. It's like that. So you get the impression that, look, oh my God, so many institutions have this bad view of these evil Indian uh, government, fascist, etc. But in fact, it's four institutions and their opinions. And if you go and dig into who, how do they arrive at them, it's also quite interesting. So, for example, the democracy index, you look into how the democracy, it's actually the opinions of experts. After all, you know, the, if, if, how do you decide whether somebody is a good democracy or a bad democracy? So, in all these democracy index, India will be, you know, 100 and something or 95 or some such ranking. And we are the world's largest democracy, we are ranked 95. How? So, you dig in and you, you can do this yourself because they put them, to be fair, they put their methodology up. And you'll find it's the opinions between five and 25 so-called experts. They don't even tell us who those experts are. Now, even for a room this size, I mean, it's not statistical, statistically significant if I try to figure out your opinion by taking the opinions of five people, right? So they managed to rank whole countries based on this. And it's extraordinary how this is done without uh, anybody pushing back. So I began to write a series of articles to push back against this. So, uh, the good news is that as a result of these articles, many of people have begun to question these indices. And so, whenever these think tanks uh, put up these indices, there's usually some Indian in the crowd who stands up and begins asking questions and says, you know, there's this paper by Sanjeev Sanyal which has said this, 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 and so on. So now, uh, I think I'm beginning to get on their nerves. So, about six months ago, uh, the uh, director of Varieties of Democracy Institute, which is a Swedish uh, institute, which is much into all of this. He, that director was asked by a journalist, you know, there is this uh, mad economist in India, he keeps asking these questions. What is your answer to these, these, these questions? So interestingly, he didn't answer any of the questions. His response basically was that all of this is being 
done, all, our, uh, all this material that we are gathering from these experts is being run through uh, supercomputers using high maths. Now I'm amazed, they thought that they were going to frighten an Indian with maths and computers. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, it's ridiculous. And then he goes on to, and by the way, this interview is online. You can read this interview, it's ridiculous. And then he goes on to say, you know, we are the great astronomers of the social science space. What? Uh, just like, you know, rocket science and astronomy uh, figures out the movement of the stars, we are working out the movements of political movements, something to that effect. I mean, the exact words are this. But the, I'm just telling you the sheer absurdity of the whole thing and the fact that everybody is willing to take it. Now, the problem is, Till now, either we took it seriously or we ignored it. I'm of the view you cannot ignore all of this because this sort of bullshit eventually has real world implications because they begin to slowly filter their way into, you know, they'll get gathered into the world governance indicator of the World Bank and they'll get a stamp of authority or they'll find their way into our sovereign ratings. Now there's a new scam called ESG, Environment, Social and Governance Norms, okay? Now, they will essentially give you certificates based on it, and large uh, pools of money, like JP Morgan or Blackstone, et cetera, will actually allocate money based on these ESG. But if you go and dig into it, it's all garbage. I mean, you, you, do you know who gets the highest ESG ratings by, uh, in the world for these things? Tobacco companies. <laughs> Tobacco companies have higher ESG ratings than Tesla. Right? So they are not even pretending. And by the way, this is a debate in this country as well, but this is an internal debate. You have to understand that this sort of thing is going on worldwide as well. And <clears throat> there has to be a pushback and you'll be pleased to know that at least in India, uh, we are pushing back against this. Yeah, I think um, that's some interesting points you've made. So obviously the, the motive behind ESG is a noble one, right? It's to improve social and environmental concerns and kind of uh, fight against various challenges that are facing um, India and the world at large. So instead of these current ESG policies, and you obviously have done a lot of research into climate finance and uh, things like that. So what kinds of green financial instruments and policies do you think um, can replace ESG and help India um, achieve its rapid economic growth, but at a sustainable uh, so let manner. me first talk, finish this thought about ESG so you know what ESG really is. You see, the term ESG popped up in a 2006 paper from the United Nations in an innocuous way saying that we should have some environmental, social, and governance norms. Now, obviously, nobody's going to say, no, we shouldn't have such things. They are good things. But very helpfully, this paper did not define what these norms were. And so people forgot about it. Everybody said, yes, yes, agree, agree, agree. A few years later, maybe seven, eight years later, suddenly these some think tanks began to define these norms in peculiar ways. Okay, nobody pushed back against them, but they arrived at these ESG norms uh, without any discussion with the rest of the world. Now in the beginning it sounded fairly benign, but effectively what happened after a little while was that these norms were, began to be set in stone. For example, last year beginning, 2023 beginning, the European Union began to mandate that this, these norms have, are basically, uh, now have to be applied to anybody exporting to the United Nation, uh, to the uh, U European Union and so on. So what happens is, without any discussion with the rest of the world, again, the same think North Atlantic think tanks, which I was complaining about earlier, are the same ones that are heavily involved in this, and of course a bunch of consultancies as well. And again, they make money by essentially doing certification. Um, so first of all, it's a form of jizya tax, right? We will certify you if you behave well. But also the way they're defined is quite interesting. So for example, the European Union wants you to uh, says that you can only export green steel to the European Union. And I'm, it's not just raw steel, if you're sending cars there or anything made of steel, you have to make for green steel. But if you dig a little bit deeper, you will discover that the way they define green steel is <coughs> that you have to manufacture it in a way 
in which they own all the patents. So again, it's a form of jizya tax. So you have to, if you want to make steel, you have to make, give, pay them for those patents, make it like that, maybe buy in, machines from them. Only then you can you uh, sell stuff back to them. So you see at every stage, the rules are set in a way in which effectively somebody has neo-colonial control over you. For a long time, nobody pushed back against this. The Chinese basically ignored it or found, used some heavy arm tactic to go around it. Uh, India, till very recently, was a good boy. But now I think we have begun to push back and say that, you know, what is all of this? And, you know, I am myself written extensively about, uh, against this. And you'll be pleased to hear that as a result of our pushing back, organizations, for example, like the World Bank, have begun to reevaluate something called a World Governance Indicator, which was, by the way, a major input into many of these ESG things. Nobody realized, and it's incredible, that this World Governance Indicator of the World Bank was actually put together by two economists who were not even in the World Bank. And it was on their website, and if you went through their website carefully, at the bottom there was a disclaimer that <clears throat> the, the World Bank does not endorse any of these indicators. You've got to be kidding me, it's in your website. And then based on it, many other people were doing further and further things. So the whole thing was based on somehow two economists managed to wangle their way in and get this thing on their website and given a stamp of authority for just random opinions they happen to have. So this is the kind of thing that goes on. Now, what should we do? First of all, push back against all of this. Go back to first principles. Three, develop our own norms. You see, you do need norms, but you need to develop, we need to be a part and parcel of the conversation. Not just us, but the global south, more widely as well, needs to be brought into the conversation. And by the way, when we have global agreements like the Paris Agreement, we actually followed what we have promised. It is very often the West that pulls out and doesn't do uh, stand up to what they signed up for. So I think there has to be a mechanism of holding other countries, particularly those in the West who go, like lecturing other places, uh, accountable for the things they signed up for. So I think this is part of a wider issue that has to be a much more equity, um, a much more equitable balance of conversation. Okay, um, just switching gears up now a bit, I think initially in our talk you mentioned India's history as a prominent maritime nation. Um, what present day implications do you see uh, for the way in which India conducts its foreign policy and economic strategy based on its current maritime um, powers and capabilities? So yes, I mean, India's history, and oddly enough, even in India, but certainly outside India, not many people are re realize that India's, much of India's history is maritime. Shouldn't be surprising, just look at where India is and its shape. So obviously, uh, we were exploring uh, the seas for thousands of years. In fact, we are the only country in the world which has an ocean named after us. Yeah? So <clears throat> much of our history is actually maritime. Now, the the modern implication of this is this. You see, if you're sitting in landlocked Delhi, then the only neighbors you think about is a friendly neighbor to our west and another friendly neighbor to our northeast. But if you think in maritime terms, we have other neighbors. We have, our neighbors are Oman and the UAE. It's Indonesia and Singapore. It's even Australia, which is, by the way, an Indian Ocean country, people forget this, they tend to think of Australia as a Pacific country, but in fact, it is the second largest Indian Ocean economy, right? It's our neighbor, and we, in fact, do import and export a lot with Western Australia, as increasingly, as people don't realize this. So this begins to have a very different worldview that begins to emerge uh, once you begin to take a maritime view of things. So thankfully, we now have a, a prime minister from a maritime state so we have begun to take our maritime worldview much more seriously. And it has real world implications already. So let me give you one which is live right now. You're aware that there is a lot of problems right now uh, in the Red Sea area and uh, the, the generally in the Middle East. The only reason these shipping lanes are currently open 
is because the Indian Navy is keeping it open. <laughs> historically, historically, uh, in the 19th century, these lanes were kept open by the British. In the 20th century, it was basically because of uh, Pax Americana. Am American ships kept that open. There are still American ships uh, in that area uh, who we, we, we coordinate very closely with. But let's say for the last few, three, four months, while the Americans are there, they've mostly been focused by sending out missiles and bombing the Houthis or whatever it is. The on the ground, boots on the ground is provided exclusively by the Indian Navy. So we have some 40 odd ships in the last three, four months that Indian Navy has boarded and freed from pirates. Right? This, and this is just in that area. We are also patrolling the other parts of the Indian Ocean region. We are trying to build up a naval base on the Lakshadweep side, but also on the Andaman Nicobar side. Remember, the <clears throat> Malacca Straits uh, is essentially controlled by India for, because of the Andaman and Nicobar Islands. The southernmost island is an immediate tip of the Malacca Straits. So whoever controls that, those islands, Nicobar Islands, effectively controls the, Nicobar, uh, the Malacca Straits. Now this has huge geopolitical implications because many people talk about the rise of India economically, but our geopolitical role is something that we are already doing. Mm -hmm. And as America finds it increasingly difficult to do various things in all parts of the world, um, you know, they need a presence, we need, India too needs its presence in, in the Pacific, uh, that it has a role in the Eastern Mediterranean right now, maybe in, in the North Atlantic. Um, India has already taken on a major role providing uh, uh, security in uh, of the uh, Indian Ocean region. We are playing that as we speak. I think, yeah, that's really interesting when you look at, when you change your frame of reference and you start looking at India as a maritime nation rather than just an economic powerhouse or a, a melting pot of culture. I think, yeah, it really changes the way you look at things. So. Yeah, just diving more deeper into India's history as a maritime nation and what we're doing, what efforts we're doing currently. Um, I think Mr. Sanyal has a short presentation. Yeah, I want to make a presentation so to show you how, um, first, uh, we, we in India are taking our maritime past much more seriously, firstly, and how it can, in today's world, be used for um, diplomacy, cultural diplomacy. So let me show you this presentation. Um, yep, here we go. So this is a story of in maritime India uh, over the last 5,000 years. I'll give you a very short presentation on it so you get a sense of it. So as I said, India is the only country in the world with an ocean named after it. And we have, if you look at Indian temples, Indian manuscripts, you will find full of ships. Yeah, the, and uh, here are a couple of examples, one from the Mughal period, one from an earlier period. And one thing do notice, they're all involve a peculiar kind of design where the planks are all stitched together. And I'll come to that a little later, but I just want you to notice from this. Now, as I said, we have been trading with the rest of the world for thousands of years. This is a Harappan comb found in Oman, in a site in Oman. It's 4,500 years old. And there's Indian culture everywhere. The largest Hindu temple in the world is not in India. It's in Cambodia, yeah, Angkor Wat. And you can see, you, you know, uh, Ganesh, Saraswati, these are gods that are worshipped, for example, as far away in Japan. Uh, Saraswati and Ganesha, by the way, very popular um, uh, deities in Shintoism and widely worshipped. So it's not just in Bali, which everybody knows about, but in many other places where uh, Hindu and Buddhist culture has spread and is alive to this day. And there are accounts by, uh, by foreign travelers about uh, 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 Indian shipping from the past. So there's Ptolemy C in the first century saying Indian shipbuilders built a fleet of about 2,000 ships, each capable of accommodating 1,000 troops, horses, and vast quantities of supplies. So these are not trivial sized ships, by the way. Um, Marco Polo talks about a ship there was so large that a crew of 150 to 300 men, propelled by oars and sails, multiple decks, 60 cabins for merchants, ships subdivided in bulkheads, fastened with iron nails. I want to say this because I will later talk about a different kind of ships, but Indians did also build ships with iron nails. 
And Nicola Conti talks about a uh, ship weighing 1,000 tons. That's a, a pretty, pretty huge ship, by, even by modern standards. And you have Santo Stefano talks about timbers of the ships being stitched together with cords and sails, etc. So there's a huge amount of foreign uh, visitors to the Indian Ocean talking about Indian maritime activity on a huge scale. And just as an aside, um, much of this maritime trade, interestingly, were funded uh, by temples. Uh, it is important to remember that Indian, tem uh, Indian temples had so much gold. Many of you hear about a lot of gold in Indian temples. It happened because they were essentially functioning as uh, venture capital and banks. That's why they had so much gold. It wasn't because uh, Indian kings uh, out of piety were handing over all their gold to the temples, as some of you may have been given the impression. Uh, getting Indian politicians to hand over their gold to anyone at any point in time is quite difficult. <laughs> And there are texts. This is a 10th century text by Raja Bhoj called the Yukti Kalpataru. And it mentions huge ships that were built. There were sadharan ships, which were ordinary ships, which were merchant ships. And there were specialized ships, which are more narrow and thin. And you have all the classification and length, breadth, etc. Uh, the biggest one, the Beguinis, were 176 cubits long and 22 cubits broad. So these were enormous ships, even by modern standards. And what do they look like? Here is a painting from the Ajanta Caves, which is a large painting actually, almost the size of this screen. Um, and you can see it's a bit damaged, but you can tell it's, it's a, it's a, it's a sea-going ship. Uh, you can see a human being there, sails, etc. It's obviously an artistic representation, but you can see this as well. Now, how are these ships put together? Now, not all. But the bulk of these ships, interestingly, were not nailed together. For, for a variety of reasons, Indians liked to stitch their ships together. And this technology was widely used uh, across the Indian Ocean, including by the Arabs as well. But the Indians used this. Now, this technology has obviously gone into steep decline in modern times, but it is just about alive. So there are small boats that are still built. Uh, along in coastal villages using this technique, but for generations you haven't had really big ships built using this technique. But there have been some historical uh, reconstructions that have been done by other countries. The, uh, for example, the Jewel of Muscat in 2008-2009 uh, was constructed in 9th century uh, Belitung shipwreck by the Omanis. So the Omanis have done a reconstruction Others have done some reconstruction, 82, something in 2003, the Egyptus, which is a reconstruction of Greek, ship, uh, Greek shipwreck and so on. So others have done uh, such reconstructions. So I decided that we should also reconstruct a ship uh, using ancient technique based on that painting I showed you from Ajanta. So the idea is basically build an ocean going ship using ancient techniques. We have got the Yukti Kalpataru, we have descriptions from others, we have paintings, etc. And try and rebuild a ship of that kind, and then, very importantly, sail it to all these places and see how it goes. So we, I put up a proposal, the Ministry of Culture has blessed it, so we got the mon money, and the Indian Navy has said that they will help uh, kind of curate it and provide me with uh, sailors to sail it. So this project is on since last year, and um, here are all the stuff that is needed to build the ship. So obviously there is the wood, but then you use resin called kudru for because you're not nailing it together, so for all the holes, you use coir, a special kind of coconut coir rope for tying and stitching the ropes together and so on. And so this is what is used to do it. And here is what is happening. This is the keel laying. This is the first step. You lay the keel. You have to use steamers to try and bend the wood in a particular way. So you have to use steaming and hot water. Then this is the fill the steam and then you make the planks. And important thing here, uh, I think, sub, uh, am I getting in the way of the thing? Anyway, yeah. I think you'll have to move away. I think you're getting in the way of the, yeah. Now, what happens is that, uh, note that essentially there are no nails used in this, okay? So this is how the stitching happens. Can you see the stitches here? So this is how the thing is stitched together. And you can see all the stitching. And it's done in a cross, one, one cross style. So it's not going round and round. There's a particular stitch that is used for wadding. You can see more of this as well, how it, is being put, how it gets put together. And then once the hull is built, now this is very interesting. 
In a normal ship, you build a frame and then you nail the structure together. Here, in fact, you do it the other way around. You actually build the hull and then you begin to create a frame around it. So here are some more of these, how it's done. And then it is plugged together with this kudrus um, gum, because the gaps in the holes are then filled with this kudrus gum, uh, which is uh, mixed in fish oil. Um, and then you plug the holes. Uh, it stinks like hell. But I have been uh, told that after a few weeks, it goes away. So I hope that does, does happen. Anyway, so here is this uh, project I talked about. As I said, the funding comes from the Ministry of Culture. The Ministry of Defense, i.e. the Indian Navy, is going to provide the crew and the, uh, and the design, uh, helping me to put the design together. Uh, Ministry of Shipping, providing me with re regulatory approvals, trials, and so on. And here is a schematic representation of the ship I'm trying to do. The four, remember the painting? This is just a sketch of the same thing. And this is what we are actually building. This is the line drawings of the ship that is now being done. It's 21 meters long, by the way. Uh, <clears throat> about 65 feet, I think. Yeah. And uh, this is of actually illustrative photograph from the Jewel of Muscat from an earlier era, just to show you the kind of stuff that will eventually happen. The, the, the project is already under construction uh, in a shipyard in Goa using uh, shipwrights from Kerala, Bepur in Kerala. And uh, one or two of them had worked on this original project, so they have some idea of doing ancient ships, so I use them. Uh, and here is the, then the idea is that this project that is being constructed, will, the ship itself will get finished by this time next year, then six months of outfitting and testing, etc. So by mid-2025, we'll do the sea trials. This is a model of the ship for, so that you know what it will look like. And then there we want to sail it. That is going to be the fun part. Um, my original idea was to sail it to Indonesia starting from uh, Kalinga, and I'm still going to do this. Uh, you start from Kalinga. There's a festival there called Bali Jatra, or the Voyage to Bali. So I want to recreate that by taking this as the way all the way from Kalinga, uh, Urissa, sail down to Sri Lanka, cross to Sumatra, and then go all the way to Bali. That trip needs about three months. And the winds uh, are such that you can start in November. And then um, when the winds turn south, from north-south, and you use that and then go across. So that is one route that we intend to do. But the first trip will be a shorter one, which is the one on the other side. Um, <clears throat> which will be from India to Oman. And uh, in December, when uh, the Sultan of Oman had visited India, there was a joint statement by uh, Prime Minister Modi and uh, the, the, uh, the Sultan of Oman, uh, Oman uh, saying that the very first voyage of the ship will be fr uh, from Gujarat to uh, Muscat. So this one uh, we are looking to do uh, in end 2025. So hopefully by then I'll have figured out and learned sailing. <laughs> uh, here is the joint statement uh, of, the, uh, of the two leaders. And this is what the project looked like uh, on the 10th of February when I went to see the thing. You can see how the stitching is done. And here is the external frame that is being used to create the, the hull. These are external frames. They're not a part of the ship. They'll be removed once the hull is built. And then the internal frame will be put in. So, with that, the journey begins. So, thank you for that presentation, Mr. Sanyal. We now open up the floor to any questions. Um, yes, Professor Myron. I felt like I was in a classroom again, <laughs> Professor. <laughs> Uh, you know, I, and, and actually it did remind me of another class that I took when I was doing my MBA. This is a global strategy class, which showed, which this professor told us, this slide still remembers in my mind, that every century belonged to a different country that had economic power and military power. And military power often was associated with naval power. Um, but we also know that, you know, we, we talked about what's happening with Houthis and, and how Indian Ocean, India's playing a role. American ships are there as well, British ships. 
um, it seems like there are different theaters of activities across different oceans, if you will, and different economic activity going on and different dominant forces in China and the US and of course European as, EU as a bloc and India is emerging as a, as a major economic power. Um, do you think that the future, uh, even if you look at it from a maritime perspective, um, on the next 20, 30 years, will be this fractionated world with, uh, you know, countries controlling specific geographic areas? Um, uh, or do you think it's going to be partnerships that are going to control the world? Um, what, what, what does that future look like? I mean, I, I'm, 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 because it's still uncertain right now. So it's very obvious that the world as it stood under Pax Americana is unwinding in a sense. Uh, in fact, it goes further be beyond that. Uh, the world that as it sort of the st structure, architecture of the world order, not just since the collapse of Soviet Union, but in fact, going all the way even further back to so the way it was constructed after the Second World War, is unwinding in some form. Um, Europe's role is shrinking. Uh, the US continues to be the world's dominant power in, in multiple ways, but not dominant to the level of being predominant, uh, you know, in, in being able to run the whole world. So that, that universe is unwinding. Now, those of you who read my writings will know that I'm a complexity theory guy, which means I don't believe in predetermined paths. This can go in any direction. I'm not going to attempt to predict where it will go. So as a policymaker, I am not wasting my time thinking about how and predicting how the world will, will uh, break down. Instead, I am trying to create optionalities, okay? So irrespective of how the world turns out, I need to have options. So that means that my policy making is based on doing the following things. First of all, uh, create networks um, where possible, but those networks in spaces. So, you know, there is the quad framework, there's the I2U2 framework, but you know, we will continue to, for example, deal with Russia as we have continued to do it when it serves our interest. Uh, and we are unapologetic about that. Um, similarly, we will do it in economic sphere, we will do it in uh, technology, and so we will create partnerships, but at the same time, we are trying very hard to create indigenous capabilities in every area particularly in areas where we will, be in fact, we will be affected by breakdowns in the rest of the world. And I'll give you one example of it. Our interest in, for example, encouraging certain kinds of electronics, particularly chip manufacturing, et cetera, in India, and it's an expensive thing to try and encourage them to come and build, is not merely some you know, uh, import substitution idea. It is an idea born out of the view that look, these chips go into everything we manufacture. And they come from tiny single source uh, factories. If something happens to them, it could be a war, it could be another epidemic, it could be an earthquake, I don't know, I can't predict this. But I need to have certain indigenous capabilities that I can keep myself running. And the same is true for you know, pharmaceutical APIs. And so I am creating optionalities. You have to understand what am I doing? I'm creating optionalities. Same thing I'm doing with defense. I don't know how the defense universe will be in the, into the future. I don't know what wars will be fought. Maybe wars won't even be fought. But I'm creating optionalities. I'm investing in indigenous capabilities in terms of even, you know, drones and, and fighter jets or whatever it is. We are creating indigenous capabilities creating partners in various spheres. And the most important thing to us in this fluid world is effectively to have, uh, uh, be clear about our interests. And we have discovered that when we are clear about our interests, uh, others are actually willing to accommodate it, assuming that when they, when they, they articulate their interests, we accommodate it as well. So for example, you have what would, is my mic still working? Yeah. Hello. It's not working. It goes in and out. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah. So for example, if you're clear about your interests and articulate it, um, and, but at the same time, you know, you accommodate other people's interests, rather than in a world where everybody is trying to say one thing, do something else, and so on, 
we found that we could, you can actually make friends in, in impossible co combinations. So let me show you. Everybody accuses the current government, oh my God, this is Hindu nationalist government, must be fascist and so on. But in fact, India has never had such good relations with the Middle East. Yeah? We are besties with the UAE. Two weeks after opening the Ram Janmabhumi temple, we also opened one in Abu Dhabi of all places. We are good friends with Oman. We even have good relations with Saudi Arabia. And interestingly, we also have a working relationship even with Iran. Because we are actually, India is right now supplying arms to Armenia. How do you think it gets there? It actually goes by road from Chabahar port to Armenia. So what I'm trying to tell you here is that we are clear about what our interests are. And in a world where everybody is trying to say something, do something else, and it's all fuzzy, the fact that we are seen as being clear um, and predictable and willing to help others if, if when they need it. I mean, we, we will give you vaccines if you, if, when you need it or do other things when needed if your interests are there. Then it creates actually a rather clear framework for a relationship that goes beyond this cloak and dagger kind of approach that unfortunately now dominates much of the world. And this uncertainty it's creating is actually uh, in some ways in our view utterly un uh, unnecessary. I'm afraid that's all we have time for. Uh, thank you so much for coming okay. here. It was an honor. Thank you very much.